Item Number SCP-211 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Because of the suburban location of SCP-211, the surrounding neighborhood has been vacated through intentional introduction of pollutive industry and redistricting to promote NIMBY sentiment. In addition, the property surrounding SCP-211 is currently under Foundation management, and an armed guard has been stationed in the buildings. Unauthorized personnel entering the area are to be terminated on site. A series of explosive charges has been set within SCP-211 and is to be examined every days for degradation. Should SCP-211 become overtly hostile, or neutralization is otherwise requested, it is to be terminated by detonating these charges simultaneously. To avoid inadvertent activation of SCP-211's defense mechanisms, extraction of SCP-211-1 should take place at a rate of fewer than pages per hour. Description: SCP-211 is a two-story building located in an abandoned district of Indiana. Records from undisclosed archives heavily suggest that the building was originally a middle-class dwelling belonging to G.S., since deceased of natural cause. Since then, all furnishings have disappeared, save standard light fixtures and a radiator, pictured above. Note that several of these light switches have not been discovered, rendering them useless. Additionally, the building's topography has been nearly completely covered with an estimated sheets of paper, hereafter collectively designated as SCP-211-1. Given these facts, SCP-211 itself is in remarkably poor condition. Severe mold and grime contamination are threatening to collapse a large section of the second floor, and the attempted May 4th demolition has left a large hole in the south wall of the building. Recovered sheets of SCP-211-1 may be of various aspect and origins. Blank, depicting various images, ripped pages from books, most often encyclopedias or novels, printouts from the internet, etc. The paper may be of any color. In fact, the above picture is of the only hallway in which all sheets are printed on white paper. Entire stacks of paper have been discovered in the building's basement, whose individual sheets bear little or no relation to each other. Their only real identifying characteristic is that individual sheets' edges are unusually sharp, and that should a portion of SCP-211-1 be removed, more sheets appear from unknown origin, as replacement. Research is pending, but so far, individually. SCP-211-1's constituent parts seem to have little purpose, beyond and defense. Document 211-01 SCP status for SCP-211 was established after the building was condemned and scheduled for demolition on the 4th of May, 2000, when the building attacked the team hereafter labeled Incident Zero. The following is an interview of E.R., one of four survivors, conducted by Dr. Spinoza. Begin Log Dr. Spinoza, please state your name and occupation. Interviewee E.R., employed at construction. Well, former employee. Can't exactly do my job with one crippled leg, now can I? Dr. Spinoza, my sympathies. Please discuss the events involving the attempted destruction of Data Expunged. R. Well, we, construction that is, were commissioned to destroy that thing, so we set about finding the best way to do it. We pretty much ruled out undermining for some reason. Something to do Data Expunged. Main thing is management decides to just use a couple of bulldozers to level the thing. Dr. Spinoza. Was there any action on the part of the building before you attempted demolition? R. Not really. We went in there, after all, making tests and all that. Found the mold, joked about all that paper all over the place. Only thing that really happened before we started was... Yeah. When we were in the basement and someone else, I forget who, started ripping pages from the wall, just to check how bad the mold was. Big stack of the stuff suddenly drops from the ceiling, out of nowhere, on top of the guy and he gets a nice bunch of paper cuts. Thing that got us, though? His gear was all cut up as all hell. I mean, clothing, hat, glasses, what have you. All nicked up. Had a big damn gouge in his glasses. Damn good thing he was wearing those glasses, I tell you. 
Dr. Spinoza. And then, R. Well, we didn't like being in a big house of knives, you know? So we got him out of there. Other than that, besides, well, you know, nothing else happened. Dr. Spinoza. And on May 4th, R. Well, we had everything set up and started driving a pair of bulldozers towards the house. When all of a sudden, all that paper on that one wall, outside, right? Well, it all just falls off by itself. Now, I should tell you, that day there wasn't a breeze in the air at all. So we thought that, well, the building's destroying itself and stuff. And we decide to help it along. And all of a sudden, there's a big rumble. One you can hear over the bulldozers. And all that paper flies into the air by itself and tears up everything in sight. End of interview. End log. Document 211-02. Subsequent to Incident 0, testing was taken to determine the responsiveness of SCP-211. D-Class personnel were issued a video camera in order to interact with SCP-211 in various ways. Video Log 1. Subject. D-19905 ordered to approach and explore SCP-211. Result. No response. D-19905 interacted with SCP-211-1 without threat. Building map of first floor made with camera footage. Video Log 2. Subject. D-19905 ordered to approach and extract a sheet of SCP-211-1. Result. No response. Page appears to be... Video Log 3. Subject. D-19905 ordered to approach and extract a pile of SCP-211-1 near SCP-211's entrance. Result. Before extracting the target, D-19905 hesitates and examines a large poster on the wall near it. When questioned, D-19905 remarks that it's a painting that he made while incarcerated at and proceeds to pick it up without incident. When D-19905 picks up the target, a pile of SCP-211-1 falls over, landing on him. D-19905 emerges, suffering lacerations to arms, legs, and face, but manages to extract the collection from SCP-211. Video Log 4 Subject D-19905 ordered to approach SCP-211 and explore second floor. Result D-19905 enters building via Incident Zero Hole without incident. Upon entering contaminated area, D-19905 steps on a weakened part of the floor, which collapses. D-19905 exits building with a broken leg. Well, at least we know we can destroy it if we need to. Dr. Spinoza Video Log 5 Subject D-21938 issued a pack of matches in order to light a sheet of SCP-211-1 within SCP-211 on fire. Result. Data expunged. Remains removed from door, but main entrance to SCP-211 is now blocked, leaving the Incident Zero hole as the only entrance. Let's not try that one again, alright? I mean, ugh. Dr. Spinoza. Addendum 211-01 Since collection of SCP-211-1 has begun, several specific books have become identified as their origin. Examples of these are as follows. A 19 copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf, found in an undisclosed public library. A Java data structures book, printed in 19 discovered in a used bookstore near Site-17 currently stored in the United States Library of Congress. Three printouts of Japanese broadcasts decoded during the Magic Crypt Analysis Project in World War II. The drawing in document 211-02, etc. No documents regarding the Foundation have been discovered as of yet. However, security has been increased as a mild informational security threat. Addendum 211-02 Recent unexplained phenomena regarding SCP-211 have provoked further study. On the 28th of March, three individual sheets of SCP-211-1 were found in SCP-211's entrance. 
Examination of these sheets proved to be Foundation Protocol Memoranda, addressed to Dr. Spinoza, the interviewer of the previously mentioned ER. Upon questioning, Spinoza, who had been at Site-17 regarding another project, noted that the notices had disappeared soon after he received them, adding that data expunged. Since this date, there have been other data security breaches involving SCP-211-1, several of which involve SCP-211 as subject material. Upgrade to Euclid status pending. Item Number SCP-210 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures the property containing SCP-210 has been designated as Site- The primary responsibility of guards on said site is to prevent entry by trespassers and maintain the cover story detailed in Document 210-1. The servants' quarters adjacent to SCP-210 have been deemed safe for human habitation and may be used for on-site housing. A remotely controlled vehicle is to be sent into SCP-210 on a monthly basis to catalog any changes. Description SCP-210 is a two-story mansion, flooded to a depth of 4.35 meters with an unknown fluid substance. The substance, designated SCP-210-1, possesses a refractive index nearly identical to water. This fluid is invisible from the outside of SCP-210, and does not flow out of SCP-210 if a door or window is opened. Any living creature that comes into contact with SCP-210-1 enters a sleep-like state and begins drifting through SCP-210-1, as if neutrally buoyant. Beings trapped in this manner are designated SCP-210-2. To date, instances of SCP-210-2 have been cataloged by remote means. Instances of SCP-210-2 emit a constant stream of bubbles as if exhaling, despite no source of air being identified, and subjects appearing to breathe as normal. Subjects have been noted to move through SCP-210-1 slowly, as if dancing. It has not been determined if this is under the power of the subjects, or of microcurrents within SCP-210-1. SCP-210 came to the attention of the Foundation when an agent embedded in the County Police Department received a number of related missing persons reports. Mobile Task Force IOTA-12, Dam Feds, was dispatched to intercept the investigations. The disappearances were quickly traced to a party held at SCP-210 in 2000, with several subsequent disappearances resulting from persons undergoing private investigations. Two team members were lost on initial contact with SCP-210, the first when entering through the front door, and the second while attempting to recover the first. The full documentation of this investigation can be found in Document 210-1. Addendum 210-1 Attempts to remove SCP-210-2 from SCP-210-1 have failed, as instances of SCP-210-2 which reach the edge of SCP-210-1 will not travel any further. Instances of SCP-210-2 cannot be damaged. This property extends to clothing, evidenced by remote attempts to harvest sample material. Furniture and other inanimate objects within SCP-210-1 behave as if in normal atmospheric conditions, and may be removed from the residence. Removed items show no anomalies. Addendum 210-2 the remote observation of SCP-210 in 2000 was unable to locate SCP-210-2-7. Note: We have been completely unable to locate SCP-210-7 on subsequent observations. A request has been placed for tracking devices in case of further disappearances. Researcher B. Item number: SCP-274. Object class: Keter. Special Containment Procedures Any buildings found to be infected with SCP-274 are to be reported immediately to a superior and the leader of Mobile Task Force Pi-1, City Slickers. MTF Pi-1 is to incinerate cases of SCP-274-1 and secure the infected buildings by forming a quarantine with a one-kilometer radius under the guise of the local police and fire department. 
MTF Pi 1 is to terminate any cases of SCP 2742 through the use of high pressure fire hoses. Civilians insisting on entering an instance of SCP 2741 are to be detained and have one Class B amnestic administered. Any apparatus used to contain or handle SCP 274 should either be incinerated or entirely composed of metal or glass and washed thoroughly immediately after use. The cover story for a containment breach of SCP-274 should be gang-related arson. Description: SCP-274 is a paint of variable color. Buildings inflicted with SCP-274 appear to have large amounts of graffiti covering the sides of the building and often have large, disturbing designs to them. While its consistency is that of normal paint, its composition reveals it to be 28% hemoglobin, 12% gastric acid, and 60% common components consisted with Krylon brand spray paint. When SCP-274 is applied to a wall, it will begin to spread until it has covered the wall and any walls attached to it. SCP-274 is unable to spread on metal, glass, and horizontal surfaces. While SCP-274 spreads on buildings, it will convert the interior of a wall into a large mesoglea, the interior walls into a gastrodermis, and the exterior walls act as a protective shell and epidermis. Buildings coated entirely with SCP-274 will become cases of SCP-2741. SCP-2741 exhibits signs of life, react to stimuli, and behave in a manner similar to many species of the Anthozoa class. Buildings converted into SCP-2741 lure passing civilians by emitting noises from inside SCP-2741. Sounds of glass breaking, loud coughing, or pained whimpers have all been reported from D-Class personnel. It is currently unknown whether SCP-2741 or the SCP-2742s are responsible for this behavior, as the noises stop immediately after entry. Typically. Civilians will either call the police or investigate the noises themselves. As subjects search inside SCP-2741, they will be recognized as food by instances of SCP-2742, if any are present. When a victim enters a room inside SCP-2741, barring the entryway, they will immediately be suctioned into a gastrovascular cavity belonging to SCP-2741 later processing them into SCP-274 and one instance of SCP-2742. Specimens of SCP-2742 are organisms composed of SCP-274 that appear as men or women wearing a gas mask or respirator, along with a bright pastel-colored hoodie. SCP-2742 is able to support its heavy weight by its thickness and density in its membrane which consists of 45 to 50% of the mass of SCP-2742. SCP-2742 act as nematocysts for SCP-2741 and can disguise themselves by merging into the walls. This is done by heavily compacting themselves and implanting itself into an interior wall, save for their mask, which flattens around the wall and disguises itself as standard graffiti. This behavior has proven to be a means of ambushing food for SCP-2741 and will only react when it detects something it considers a food source. SCP-2742 possesses a hinged operculum that ejects SCP-274 located in the right hand. This operculum looks identical to a normal spray can and can project SCP-274 in a similar manner. SCP-2742 will attempt to spray SCP-274 into the eyes and mouth of its victims in an attempt to incapacitate and encapsulate them. This method of attack has shown to be very painful and will blind and numb the victim from the neck down. Once tagged, the victim is placed into a gastrovascular cavity, resulting in a new SCP-2742. SCP-2742 are able to duplicate themselves while inside an instance of SCP-2741 and will produce one new SCP-2742 every 24 hours. Once 12 SCP-2742 specimens reside inside one SCP-2741, further cases of SCP-2742 will leave SCP-2741 
and find a new building to spray with SCP-274 while avoiding any people they may encounter. Once a building at least two kilometers away from another SCP-2741 is found, the SCP-2742 will spray SCP-274 onto the building until it has completely dehydrated itself of SCP-274 and dies, resulting in another instance of SCP-2741. If left unchecked, it is estimated that SCP-274 could cover a large city within 20 days. Addendum 274 SCP-2741 Appearance Log Date found 01-2001 Appearance SCP-27411 is painted to resemble a large bus with the number on its side. The front of the bus has been replaced by a human-like face and the back is on fire. Bus patrons all look towards the front of the bus and do not seem to react to the fire. Date found 04-2006 Appearance SCP-27412 is painted to look as if it's crumbling apart. At the base, people are illustrated to be running away from SCP-27412 and a face can be seen forming from the falling rubble. Date found 03-2010 Appearance SCP-27413 depicts a beach with three sharks in the water and several people running from the shore. This scene is illustrated behind a large cartoon tiki statue which takes up most of the front of SCP-27413. Date found 08 2011 Appearance SCP-27414 illustrates what is presumed to be Noah's Ark at sea. The creatures boarding the Ark do not match any known species. The Ark is depicted to have a face with several sharp teeth and eyes devoid of pupils or irises. Date found 11 2011 Appearance SCP-27415 depicts several figures in level 3 biohazard suits at the base. Figures are seen fighting each other for what appears to be a bottle of hand sanitizer. Several cadavers are piled on top of one another in the background, with a large green cloud in the shape of a canine-like face emitting from them. This face is shown laughing, presumably at the people fighting. Date found 07 2012 Appearance SCP-27416 is painted to resemble a mausoleum with a large human skull painted on its front. Illustrated at the base of SCP-27416 are figures suffering from advanced stages of rigor mortis. Most notable is that several figures appear to be wearing the standard issue tactical armor distributed to MTF Pi-1. Date found 08 2012 Appearance SCP-27417 is decorated with the scene of MTF Pi-1 setting SCP-27417 on fire through the use of Molotov cocktails. A large depiction of SCP-2742 can be seen attacking MTF Pi-1. Date found 08 2012 Appearance Data expunged Operatives dead as a result of a large mob of SCP-2742. Item Number SCP-322 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-322 is to be contained in a secure locker in Storage Unit 3. SCP-322 can be utilized for certain missions or for research, but a full-length proposal must be submitted and accepted. Description SCP-322 is a cardboard box, 60 centimeters or 24 inches in width, 30 centimeters or 12 inches in height, and 15 centimeters or 6 inches in depth, with the words, Grow Your Own Castle Kit, and a stylized cartoon similar to those in circulation in the 1950s. The box contains a small, very simple pamphlet and a glass jar filled with large grains of sand. The pamphlet states a simple set of instructions that, when followed correctly, will produce a large castle. An exact transcript of the manual is as follows. Hey there, kiddo. So you want your own castle, 
but you don't want to waste your time imagining one, then this is the kit for you. All you have to do is plant one of the specially made castle seeds somewhere where there's a lot of free space, such as a field, under three feet of dirt. Having trouble digging that all by yourself, son? Then convince an adult to help by promising him vassalage over some of your soon-to-be kingdom. The next step is just as easy, but just as important. All you have to do is make sure you water your castle every day at 12 o'clock for seven days. That's a week! And make sure you do it too, otherwise it won't work, and then you're back at square one. Make sure you follow all the steps, and you should have your very own castle in just seven days. Pretty nifty, huh, sport? When these directions are followed, the result is a large stone fortress, including an inner keep, a courtyard, and outer wall, in the location that the seeds were planted. Placing more than one seed increases the size of the castle twofold per extra seed planted, and the styles Romanesque, Baroque, Gothic, Kremlin, Shiro et al depend on the color of the seed that has been planted. On rare occasions, when a castle has formed, there is already a staff of servants within, utterly dedicated to the original planter, although they are often inhuman in appearance. While no conclusive link between the two has been discovered, SCP-2448 is notably similar, in that it is a castle that occasionally manifests humanoid denizens. Additional Notes the object was found in Orlando, Florida, in 19 in the hands of someone trying to turn it into an amusement park. The item was confiscated, and the person in question had their memory purged. Item Number SCP-329 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures The building in which SCP-329 is located has been purchased by a Foundation Front Company and designated site Access to the site is restricted to level 3 personnel. Facility personnel to undergo full body scans at least every 48 hours. Since it is unknown how many adherents the Church of the Gardener possessed, site should be considered at risk of recapture and appropriate measures taken. Description SCP-329 is a room in a derelict building at Room is in the building's cellar, 6 meters by 5 meters, with a steel fire door. Room contains 6 folding beds. Beds are fitted with IV stands and leather restraints. 5 beds are occupied. Occupants are of both standard sexes and several races, with ages 16 through 64. Occupants have been designated SCP-3291 through SCP-3295 and have been identified as 1. No fixed address. 2. No fixed address. 3. Former medical student at University. 4. No fixed address. 5. D class personnel who was subjected to event 329A. Occupants of beds all have cancer. Type of cancer varies from occupant to occupant, but all cases have at least three tumors of grade T3N1MO or higher. Although cancers are advanced, they do not follow normal progression. Two of the cases, with a prognosis of weeks at best under normal conditions, have remained alive since at least <laughs> Occupants are alert, but in great pain, and unable to speak. Every 24 hours, at approximately 4 a.m., SCP-329 undergoes Event 329-A. The door closes with great force and cannot be reopened for the duration of the event. Anything obstructing the doorway is pulled into the room. Event 329A lasts for approximately 20 minutes, after which it is possible to open the door again. Equipment for remote observation and recording is rendered inert during 329A in a manner consistent with a non-standard space-time event. The only sounds heard from outside during 329A are screaming from the room's occupants. After the event, Occupants are apparently unharmed, bearing no incisions or external trauma. Their tumors, however, have been altered, in some cases radically. They have been reshaped, and their direction of growth has been altered. 
Three of the occupants have tumors of more than 20 feet in length, twining around and through bones and organs. SCP-3295, who was cancer-free before he was exposed to Event 329A, was found after the event to have developed a T1NOMO lung cancer, which in the three weeks since has grown to T3. Only people inside the room are affected by 329A, and those who have been removed from the room, their cancer progresses normally, resulting in death. Discovery SCP-329 was discovered by a group of university medical students who noticed abnormal cancers in the bodies of indigents supplied for dissection. They traced the source to SCP-329, which was being used as a squat. They came to the Foundation's attention through material they circulated on the internet under the name of the Church of the Gardener. When a mobile task force secured SCP-329, the Church had been operating for 11 months, luring indigents to the building with promises of drugs and shelter and subjecting them to Event 329A. Seven members of the Church were present and offered armed resistance. Five were eliminated by the MTF, and the other two held out long enough to subject themselves to Event 329A. One was subsequently vivisected by the research team, and the other designated SCP-3293. The Church's records were retrieved. They begin as relatively straightforward medical case notes, but degenerate over time into a religious screed. Addendum Document 3291 Partial transcript of video found at Data Expunged your body is an Eden after the fall, ruled by the tyranny of the Grey Devil in your skull. Your bodies are like your grey, lifeless cities, every cell marching in lockstep, any deviation punished, any growth, anything alive and green, met with cut it out, burn it out, poison it, end low sung, and the budding cancer is destroyed, or else it fights back. It brings down your body, like Samson does the Temple of Dagon. Now it has come to cure us. Each day it plants, it prunes, and it trains. It makes the Grey City a garden again, and it will take root. It will bear fruit, and it will spread across the world. Item Number SCP-358 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Due to the mental side effects of SCP-358, SCP-358 is to be kept locked at all times except during testing, and all windows are to remain boarded, with regular guard patrols to ensure that no unauthorized entry occurs. The entirety of the building should be sealed airtight, and any leaks reported immediately, along with any signs of forced entry. Anyone found inside the building with reasons other than testing should be evacuated immediately and held for questioning and observation. Description SCP-358 is an abandoned trauma center located on the outskirts of England. The grounds surrounding the building are overgrown with vegetation native to the area and characteristic of extreme neglect. The building's exterior is weathered but otherwise intact with windows and entrances boarded up to prevent trespassing and vandalism. Air inside is arid, measured on average at 45 degrees Celsius, with hotter dry gusts of air that blow through the hallways from no discernible source. Exploration and monitoring has revealed anomalous activity, characteristic of typical Type 3 pseudo-spiritual manifestation, haunting, ranging from glowing spheres to full-bodied apparitions all of which appear exhausted and, on occasion, ask for water. Recognizable apparitions appear to be individuals who have been exposed to SCP-358 beyond the average 47-minute psychological recoverability point in the past. The majority of these subjects reside in Foundation psychological observational facilities, and security footage shows them present in their respective units during the appearance of their apparitions within SCP-358. In the majority of cases, individuals with an SCP-358 experience a sense of disorientation upon entering the building, which slowly diminishes over time spent within SCP-358. Additionally, they report a growing sense of thirst, which begins to coincide with physical symptoms suggestive of extreme dehydration 
and heat exhaustion. These symptoms are not alleviated by hydration, even using a direct intravenous drip. As exposure time continues, the exposed individual will show a slowly increasing degree of mental degradation, typical of heat stroke, which leads to an exponentially increasing degree of disassociative disorder. On average, affected individuals remaining within SCP-358 are not considered psychologically recoverable beyond 47 minutes of exposure. The remaining percent of subjects exposed to SCP-358 are unaffected, but are to be kept under observation to monitor for possible later development of effects. On rare occasions, affected subjects with an SCP-358 expire suddenly of apparent poisoning. Autopsy in these cases always reveals the venom of one or more common North American desert-dwelling predators in the bloodstream, usually that of Crotalus atrox the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. SCP-358 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on 1983, when two males, ages 20 and 22, were apprehended for trespassing after being found wandering its premises, unaware of their surroundings, by local law enforcement. Medical examination revealed only physical side effects, similar to exposure to a desert setting, the psychological evaluations of each person revealed a loss in mental capacity regarding self-identification and location. A follow-up of a CT scan revealed nothing out of the ordinary. The police and medical reports were collected by SCP Foundation personnel, which led to the current testing of SCP-358. Addendum 3581 Testing Supervisor's Log Date Undisclosed Testing time duration, 30 minutes. Test subject is female, age and height expunged, with an athletic build. Upon entry, test subject observes that the climate is hot and dry. After exiting the building, the test subject appeared dazed and was observed to be suffering from slight dehydration. Test subject also brought attention to the sand in her shoes. The sand was then collected for further testing purposes. Addendum 3582 Testing Supervisor's Log Date Undisclosed Testing Time Duration 1 Hour Test Subject is Male Age and Height Expunged Slightly Overweight Test Subject entered the building as in the previous test, remarking on the arid climate inside. Further exploration revealed a layout not unlike that of any other hospital from the region and period. Upon exiting SCP-358, test subject began questioning who and where they were. Medical testing revealed that the subject was suffering from dehydration, and they were provided water to replenish lost fluids. Sand was recovered from the test subject's shoes. Test subject recovered fully in all areas, except their mental state and remains in Psychological Observation Facility A. Addendum 3583 Testing Supervisor's Log Date Undisclosed Testing Time Duration 2 Hours Test Subject is Male Age and Height Expunged Of a Wiry Stature As in other testing, Test Subject began by observing a dry and hot climate on entering the building Test subject orders were to examine the rooms of SCP-358. One hour into testing, subject began complaining of dehydration and appeared slightly confused. After a duration of two hours within SCP-358, communication from the test subject stopped and D-Class personnel were sent in to retrieve test subject. The D-Class located the subject in a room near the entrance, unconscious, and was recovered. Test subject regained consciousness soon after administration of an IV drip. Upon waking, subject was observed to be in a persistent vegetative state, unable to function, and was subsequently admitted to Psychological Observation Facility A. Blood tests revealed trace amounts of a highly poisonous rattlesnake venom found in bite victims of the deserts of Southern California. As noted in Addenda 3581 and 3582, Subject's shoes were filled with sand. Addendum 3584 
On security patrols captured video footage of a humanoid apparition in the North Hall of SCP-358, begging for water. Comparison of video footage confirms that the apparition appears to exhibit mannerisms and appearance identical to test subject C, whose test results are noted in Addendum 3583. Subject C remains unresponsive in Psychological Observation Facility A and demonstrated no change in behavior during the event. Item Number SCP-375 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures The shopping mall where SCP-375 is located has been purchased by the Foundation and repurposed as Site-375, a site for the monitoring of SCP-375 and storage of safe class SCP objects. The main sign on the front face of SCP-375 is to remain concealed at all times. Test subjects are to be shown photographs during experimentation. Testing of SCP-375 is only to take place on D-Class personnel, who are exempt from monthly termination. In order to study the cumulative effects of SCP-375 exposure. Description SCP-375 is a former Wells Fargo bank, located in Casper, Wyoming. The signage on the building and front door has been anomalously modified to read, Temporal Credit Union while retaining the original Wells Fargo typeface. A series of 11 humanoid entities, designated SCP-375-A, remain present within the building at all times, equipped in matching uniforms and claiming to be employees of SCP-375. SCP-375's anomalous properties manifest when any subject views its main sign and or interacts with the SCP-375-A instances inside the building. During Phase 1 of SCP-375 infection, subjects will feel compelled to exchange items of personal sentimental value via deposit and withdrawal. Between 12 to 24 hours after a deposit has been made, the deposited item will be replaced with an extra-universal object, designated SCP-375-B that is superficially similar to the original, but apparently from one of many alternate realities. Examples of items that have been retrieved from Phase 1 tests are provided in the table below. Phase 1 Experimental Data Subject D-34924 Item Deposited Autographed Trading Card of Major League Baseball Player Albert Pujols SCP-375-B Instance Autographed trading card of Albert Pujols for the North American Baseball League. Pujols is listed as having played for the Seattle Pilots from 2001 to 2010 and the St. Louis Browns from 2011 to 2022. Subject D-30246 Item deposited Pennies produced by SCP-1015 Subject was an SCP-10152 instance. SCP-375-B Instance 1974 United States Nickels Close examination of the nickels revealed they do not match coins produced by the United States Treasury in the 1970s and depict Harriet Tubman in place of Thomas Jefferson. SCP-1015's effects seem to cease while subject is inside the bank. Upon leaving, Subject's anomalous properties are altered so that nickels identical to those acquired within SCP-375 are produced in place of the previous pennies. Subject D-99411 Item Deposited 2009 School Yearbook from Sandalwood High School in Jacksonville, Florida, United States SCP-375-B Instance 2009 School Yearbook from Revolution High School in Harkinsville, Florida, People's Republic of America. Yearbook editorials focus on the eternal struggle against capitalism, the importance of accepting Cuban refugees from the reactionary Havana regime, and miscellaneous local developments. Subject Item deposited SCP 375B Instance. Subject D 12539. Item deposited. Autographed copy of the autobiography Under a Cruel Star by Hida Margolius Kovale. SCP 375B Instance. Autographed copy of the autobiography Fortress Prague 
by Hida Margolius Kovali. Narrative recounts the author's life in fascist-ruled Europe, beginning with the March 1939 invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Greater German Reich and ending with the Allied liberation of the continent in 1951. The author frequently expresses guilt for doing nothing to prevent the deportation and extermination of her friends and neighbors. A note has been added to the author's signature which reads, To D12539, may Europe rise from the ashes. Approximately 80% of affected subjects will not progress past Phase 1 and will continue to use SCP-375 to exchange their possessions indefinitely. However, 20% of affected subjects will experience Phase 2 of infection within six months of initial exposure. After this phase begins, SCP-375-A instances will begin asking about participating in the Temporal Exchange Program. Consent to participate will invariably be given by all affected subjects by the third time SCP-3758 instances ask about the program. Once subjects agree, they will follow instances to the employee section of SCP-375 and enter the building's bank vault. 12 to 24 hours after their disappearance, a humanoid with physical characteristics identical or near identical to that of the previous subject will exit from the bank. These humanoids designated SCP-375-C, also appear to come from alternate realities and are often wearing dramatically different attire than the original test subject. Examples of humanoids that have been retrieved from Phase 2 tests are provided in the table below. Phase 2 Experimental Data SCP-375-C Instance D-99411 Equivalent Clothing worn upon retrieval Non-standard foundation lab coat Information obtained from SCP-375-C. Instance claimed to be a researcher at the non-existent Site-13 and described a reality in which the Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition worked together to utilize and or destroy anomalous phenomena. Instance is apparently non-anomalous and was assigned to a humanoid containment wing at a nearby site, pending possible Foundation employment. SCP-375-C Instance D-40013 Equivalent Clothing worn upon retrieval Civilian clothing Information obtained from SCP-375-C Instance appeared to be heavily intoxicated and was determined to be under the influence of several anomalous drugs. When asked for the date, Instance claimed it was Liberary 32nd and expressed irritation at the Foundation for interrupting its participation in a hedonistic festival. If accurate, this marks the first known occurrence of a subject being successfully removed from an SCP-3455 event in progress. SCP-375-C Instance D-34289 Equivalent Clothing worn upon retrieval Civilian clothing Circa 1920s Information obtained from SCP-375-C Instance displayed anomalous monochromacy with its clothing and skin appearing as black and white in a manner similar to a vintage photograph. Instance remained highly distressed and loudly vocalized in pain for five minutes before its eyes appeared to transform into large anomalous white orbs and removed themselves from its body. Instance expired 15 minutes later while repeatedly expressing dismay at losing contact with the beautiful blue. SCP-375-C Instance Junior Researcher Olafsson Equivalent Clothing worn upon retrieval Non-standard Foundation Field Uniform Information obtained from SCP-375-C See Addendum 375-A Addendum 375-A In July 2018, it was discovered that Junior Researcher Olafsson a researcher assigned to SCP-375 had been using SCP-375 on himself without authorization from his superiors. After this activity was uncovered and disciplinary action had been taken, close analysis of SCP-375-B instances produced by Olafson's tests concluded that he had likely exchanged SCP object documentation with the SCP-375-A instances. Upon interrogation, Olafson admitted this was true and said each copy submitted was a printed documentation of an SCP object 
which had properties or containment procedures that personally interested him, thus fulfilling SCP-375's item criteria. Several SCP-375-B instances produced by junior researcher Olafsson are summarized below. Original SCP Documentation SCP-173, a hostile Euclid-class anomalous sculpture that is incapable of moving when observed. Retrieved Documentation Phenom number 173, a publicly displayed anomalous art sculpture that changes its appearance when left unobserved for one second every 24 hours. Original SCP Documentation SCP-4839, a Euclid-class info hazard that causes Foundation employees to believe select non-anomalous items must be contained. Retrieved Documentation SCP-4839, an Apollyon-class info hazard that caused the Foundation to destroy human civilization in an attempt to contain every object in existence. Original SCP Documentation SCP-375 Baseline Documentation Retrieved Documentation SCP-375 An anomalous bank which compels subjects to deposit items into it and eventually themselves and their family members. Subjects' body parts are then withdrawn in various states of dismemberment, referred to as compound interest. The altered SCP-375 documentation was recovered after an SCP-375-C instance, similar in appearance to junior researcher Olafsson, emerged from SCP-375 unprompted. This marked the first known spontaneous manifestation of an SCP-375-C instance without an equivalent Temporal Exchange Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.